Okay, so what we're going to do now, we're going to move on to our first keynote speaker of the day. And what's going to happen here, we're going to have, um, we're going to have Peter Thiel come up on stage. He is uh, a well-known investor and entrepreneur, and he is going to give a, about a 15 to 20 minute presentation about, the, about fintech and the future of technology. Then after that, we're going to have Bloomberg West, Bloomberg West anchor Emily Chang come up on stage, and they're going to have a, a lively discussion um, about, uh, about fintech. So for those of you who don't know, uh, don't know Peter, he is really, he's really the original fintech disruptor in many ways. He was the, the CEO and co-founder of PayPal. And after taking pay, pay, PayPal public and selling it to eBay, uh, then selling it to eBay, he has become known as the Don of the PayPal Mafia. Since so many of his, of the former, his former PayPal colleagues have since gone on to, to start many successful companies, companies like you know, SpaceX, Tesla, LinkedIn, YouTube, Yelp. And Peter himself started Palantir Technologies, a data analytics company that makes tools for national security and global finance. In 2004, he was the first outs made the first outside investment in Facebook, and he continues to serve on the board of directors there. Today, as partner of the Founders Fund uh, and in his own investing, he works to identify and support the next generation of technology companies. In this space, he has made investments in SoFi, in OnDeck, in Avant, and in Zest Finance. He's also started the Teal Foundation and the 20 Under 20 Teal Fellowship, helping to ignite a debate on the differences that might exist between learning and schooling. He's also the author of the number one New York Times bestselling book, Zero to One, Notes on Startups or How to Build the Future. Ladies and gentlemen, please join me in welcoming to the lended stage entrepreneur and investor, Peter Teal. Thank you. Uh, there's so many different uh, topics for us to uh, talk about today, but uh, one, of the, you know, one of the tremendous challenges in uh, writing about entrepreneurship and speaking about it is that uh, there is no simple formula that if I, if I were to give a formula of these are the steps you're supposed to follow uh, and you do these six things, then you will succeed, you would almost uh, necessarily know that uh, it's, it's somehow incorrect. And so I have, uh, I've, in, in, um, in, talking about, uh, in talking about these topics, I've often tried to approach it somewhat indirectly. You know, what are some contrarian questions? What are some businesses that, uh, what are some things that are true that people don't believe? What are some businesses nobody is building? And, uh, and there's certain answers that I always keep coming back to, and I want to talk about some of those and, and uh, try to bring them to bear on, uh, on, the, uh, on the FinTech context that, uh, that you all uh, think about. So the, you know, there's a single answer that I always give that's uh, the, the overwhelming, um, uh, this very important truth, I think, is that I think there are always, to a first approximation, two kinds of businesses. There are companies that compete and there are companies that don't. Uh, companies that compete like crazy don't make money. Companies that uh, don't compete, that do something unique, that's uh, very strongly differentiated, are very profitable. Um, uh, they are called by, they, they're, they're known as monopolies, even though the people who run them are generally well advised not to call them that. Um, and, um, and uh, you know, if you want to compete like crazy, you should just uh, leave the conference and try to open a restaurant in San Francisco. There are a lot of people doing that. Uh, it is not, uh, um, and it is, a, it is extremely competitive, but it is not very capitalistic in the sense that uh, uh, capitalism is about the accumulation of capital, and you will not accumulate capital by, by opening a, a restaurant. And so, um, and so the, uh, the question of uh, how, to, uh, how to go about, uh, um, you know, and, the, you know and, and, and there's certain types of uh, features these uh, monopoly businesses uh, tend to have. Uh, uh, you know, the, the, uh, the, one of the critical uh, things is that you often have to identify um, you know, it, get, it gives you a perspective. It's a little bit different from the uh, standard uh, perspective. So one of the standard venture capital, 
questions. It's always, what's the size of a market? And we, we want to go after really big markets. Um, it's what you're often told. The total addressable market, the TAM, is supposed to be very big. Um, whereas, uh, you know, from a monopoly perspective, the thing that really matters is not that you have a trillion dollar restaurant market or some su sort of super big market, but that you have a large market share. And for a startup, that uh, often means that you have to start with a very small market because you quickly want to get to a big share. And that's how uh, you can then, then expand. Um, uh, PayPal, uh, PayPal's initial market, when we started it in 1999, we launched it. Um, and we ended up uh, focusing very quickly on uh, power sellers at eBay. There were about 20,000 of them. And you could go from zero to 30 or 40 percent market share in the first three to four months, which was a, a very auspicious start. Um, and, um, and I think something like that has been, has been true of many of the successful uh, tech consumer internet companies in, uh, in, in recent decades. They, they started uh, with markets that were very small. They took over those markets. And then they sort of uh, gradually built it out in concentric circles. And, um, and um, if you look at the kinds of things that went badly wrong in Silicon Valley, like the uh, clean tech experiment from sort of 2005 to 2008, these were characterized by enormously big markets where uh, the PowerPoint presentation started with people saying, well, we have markets that are measured in hundreds of billions of dollars or trillions of dollars. And if we have a fraction of a fraction of the pie, uh, we're going to have a very successful business. And then it turned out that uh, if you're just sort of a minnow in a vast ocean, uh, you have nothing but um, incredible amounts of competition. That it's basically, uh, you know, you're a thin film solar panel company. You have to beat the other nine thin film solar panel companies. And then you have to beat the other 90 solar panel companies. And then you have to beat the windmills and the frackers and the Chinese manufacturers. And, um, and this is always a terrible place to be. Uh, you don't want to be the sort of minnow in a, in a vast ocean. Um, one, of the, um, one of the questions that I always get asked uh, uh, in a related uh, sort of context is, what are some of the trends in technology? What are things that are happening? And I always dislike this question because uh, and I'm not a prophet. I can't tell you what, what trends are happening. But I think uh, if I had to say something systematic, it is that almost all trends are overrated. That if you uh, hear a trend, by the time you've heard the trend, um, it's somehow already, um, that wave is already passed, or it's, it's way too much of a consensus thing. So, you know, trendy words in Silicon Valley, uh, trends uh, in recent years have been educational software, um, you know, healthcare IT. Um, there's been a trend around uh, uh, cloud computing, big data. SaaS enterprise, you know, if you hear big data, cloud computing, I often think you need to think fraud and run away as fast as you possibly can. And uh, if you sort of had a startup that was pitched as a concatenation of these buzzwords, you know, we're building a mobile platform uh, for SaaS enterprises to b bring big data to the cloud. That's what we're doing. Um, uh, you know, the, um, the, my pattern recognition on this, and, you know, and you know, perhaps it's a really good company and I should spend a lot of time talking to them, but the, the pattern recognition is that the buzzwords are a tell like in poker that people are bluffing and that the business is in fact not very well differentiated and that it's just one of many of a kind. That the categories are well defined and, uh, and when you tap into these well defined categories, uh, you, you often um, are, are doing something that's already very poorly uh, differentiated. And so uh, the, the great companies in many ways, I think, have, uh, have been in a category of one, where uh, one of the challenges the people starting them have is that you don't even have quite the right words to describe it, or uh, it's, it's often because there are no natural categories for, uh, for things to tap into. So these are, these are some of the kinds of things that I've, I've looked at a lot. You know, certainly, in, in evaluating startups, you always look at the technology and the people, but I think, um, I think it often also is quite valuable to think about the, the business strategy. And um, when one applies these, uh, these kinds of uh, lessons to the, to the FinTech uh, context, um, I think there are sort of a few things I, I want to maybe uh, draw out that uh, on, on, on just as a starting point, uh, FinTech obviously is a very big theme. Uh, it's, there's a, always a risk that it's something of a buzzword. It's a very 
it's a very natural theme in a way since um, you know, um, money, finance are sort of naturally thought of as zeros and ones and as digital kinds of goods. And so there's sort of a natural mapping between fintech and a lot of IT, internet, consumer uh, technologies of, of, of recent years. And uh, there's, of course, um, we, of course, are also dealing with uh, um, a sector that's you know, fairly lucrative in some sense. You know, uh, one of the, you know, one, when, I, when I started uh, working in New York, uh, you know, one, um, in, in the 90s, um, one of the thoughts was always that you, you made more money the closer you were to the money. And so people who worked on trading desks in banks made more money than the investment bankers, and the investment bankers made more than the lawyers, and the lawyers made more than the doctors. And so if you were sort of in a profession that was somehow closer to, to the money, you were naturally, um, it was easier to just keep some of it for yourself. And, um, and there is something about FinTech that, uh, that, that sort of taps into that. So <clears throat> and then, of course, we have, uh, we have a lot of the you know, existing industries, sclerotic and kind of broken and not very innovative. And so there seems to be a big opening to do things. So there's this macro story around FinTech that's, uh, that's extremely, extremely powerful. But what I, what I want to challenge people uh, here today is, is to always uh, think a lot more on the, uh, on the, on the micro level on, on this question of specific differentiation um, uh, um, and, um, and you know, what, what can be done that, uh, that other people cannot uh, sort of quickly clone, copy, um, and, you know, or, or are you just really opening a restaurant where even if it sounds like very exotic, you know, it's the only Nepalese British fusion cuisine, it's really just a restaurant, and people will sort of copy it quickly in one way or another. Uh, because, um, because this question of sort of monopoly pricing power, it's not just something that you have for sort of a brief moment in time. The really good businesses somehow are able to sustain it for quite a long time. And so, the, the, you know, so what I'm often looking for on the, on the FinTech side is trying to find some sort of a narrative, a, the, um, a story of how uh, one will build a sustainable uh, business with um, with uh, with um, you know with the sort of moat with the sort of defensibility, um, and um, and then the challenge is why it won't get copied quickly by other other people in um, in due course. Uh, there are certainly you know a, a number of different um, different angles uh, to, um, to to do this. Um, one um, sorry, one one kind of an approach, uh, and this is um, this is always I think the a challenging question in, in, in fintech is if you have a powerfully differentiated technology that's that's really dramatically better than what anybody else has, um, I, I believe that can always be a powerful differentiator. Um, I think one of the challenges is that uh, this is actually uh, quite uncommon, and so uh, uh, so it's sort of an and so I often I often think that uh, you know when you uh, talk to people in, in startups, you want to often ask the questions they're not comfortable answering. So if you're talking to a scientist starting a, a biotech startup, you want to ask business questions because they want to hide behind the science. And in a fintech context, the uncomfortable questions are often the technology questions. Where's the tech? Is it just, um, is it just a website with uh, some marketing engine attached? Um, and, um, and so, so one set of questions um, that can be powerfully differentiating is if there really is um, a dramatically better technology than exists elsewhere. Um, and then I think um, very often in the absence of that, uh, the questions come down to um, figuring out ways to, uh, to scale things very quickly and to have, have this sort of very differentiated, uh, differentiated marketplace. And, um, and the, the challenge, the questions then revolve around, is the market, um, is the market narrowly enough defined? Um, is, it, uh, is it something that, uh, that you can take over in a defensive way? Is it gonna cost too much to market? You know, a series of questions around this. Um, when, when I started at PayPal, um, and it's always so hard to even draw lessons from, from any of these businesses because, um, because it was sort of a particular moment in time, it was a particular constellation. And we, we sort of, in the, it was around the summer of 99 that we stumbled on this idea of linking money with, uh, with email, which was, which was clearly um, 
was, was clearly uh, to us a, um, an interesting, very innovative idea. Email was sort of this basic application. If you could somehow um, have this account-centric system where you uh, linked money to it, uh, that, was, that seemed like a very uh, natural kind of a thing to do. Um, it also did not seem like that technologically great a breakthrough. So even though for, you know, it was already five, six years into the internet and nobody had thought of it yet, um, you know, once we had thought of it, there was this question, why couldn't somebody else copy it really quickly in turn? And, um, and what we sort of ended up backing into was, um, was, this, uh, was this ferociously rapid uh, marketing strategy where it was, no, in fact, um, it's not going to be that defensible. And so we have to compensate by just spending money like crazy and marketing at a absolutely breakneck pace. Uh, we, um, we launched the product in October of 1999. We started with uh, the 24 people at our office as the first customers. And then we decided, well, we have to just accelerate it as fast as possible. So we're going to give everybody $10 to sign up. And we're going to give them $10 more if they refer someone else to sign up. So it's a $20 a user acquisition cost. We sort of ignored the question of whether any of the users would be uh, any good whatsoever. Um, and uh, we were able to get it to grow at sort of this uh, very happy exponential rate of 7 to 10% a day compounding. So you sort of got to 1,000 users by mid-November 99. You got to 12,000 by December 31st 99, 100,000 by February 3rd 2000. Um, and of course, there were no revenues or anything. So it was just this exponentially growing uh, cost curve. Um, by, uh, by, by early, early March of uh, 2000, um, we had about, uh, we, we combined with Elon's company, which had, was doing the same thing, it was four blocks down the street from us in Palo Alto, a 50-50 merger, um, Elon Musk's company. And then um, we had, the combined companies had $15 million in the bank, and the burn rate, uh, because the exponential growth was approaching sort of $10 million a month. Um, um, and... Um, and then you know we, we, we and, and then you know we, we, we succeeded in um, in raising a lot more capital. The marketing kept going. We started dialing it back, um, and then it uh, turned out that there was in fact a very hard technological problem. There was enormous amounts of fraud on the internet at that point of time, and so um, and actually most of the competitors, most of the banks that wanted to launch parallel products, were actually. Uh, in some ways too scared to launch anything because they thought all the money would get stolen. And so we had some time to figure out how to solve the fraud, to build more technological defensibility, and over time some of the network effects in the sort of payment system kicked in. Um, and so I, I think there's often something like the, the, the PayPal thing in some ways was, was a very crazy story. I never quite know uh, what, uh, what precise lessons one should draw. We at least had... Um, you know, a powerful vision. It was it was very differentiated, even and you know we we were honest with ourselves that it was not necessarily um, a massively sustainable advantage. There was this email money link. It was a great insight, and we had to we had to cap um, capitalize on it as aggressively and quickly as we could. Um, and I think that uh, I think these are the kinds of things that uh, that uh, one has to think about in in many of these. Uh, of these fintech businesses, you know, I've invested in a number of them over over the years, and the uh, the challenges um, are that very often, um, you know, there, there are many that are quite good and that have a dynamic that's that's somewhat similar to PayPal, where um, it's a really good idea, um, it can be copied fairly quickly, and so uh, you have to sort of aggressively raise capital for the business. Uh, it ends up being a, a somewhat dilutive uh, process as you as you scale the business. And, uh, and rapidly ramp it up. And, uh, and anything one can do on incrementally improving the business model, if you make it less dilutive, if there are ways to, to scale it um, quickly in a non-dilutive way, uh, that's both very unusual and very powerful. When you can, when you can pull that off, that's, uh, that's incredibly important. So, so, um, so we've sort of looked at all of these, uh, uh, trying to pull all these, uh, all these different things together. I think that... Um, I think that uh, I think one of the one of the areas in fintech that uh, that I, I would suggest people are a little bit too nervous about, perhaps, is uh, is the specter of regulation. And so we always have these uh, 
uh, there's always a bias to try to do things in, um, in the most unregulated way. This has certainly been true of a lot of the investments we did. It was true um, also in the PayPal history. We originally had this idea we were gonna, we were gonna just build the first, um, uh, the first cell phone bank, the first mobile bank in the world. And, uh, and then our, um, our CFO had a sort of two foot stack high of paperwork that he had to fill out to start a bank and uh, convinced us that we really didn't want to start a bank after all and that we should just, uh, just go into this, this somewhat thinner uh, payments business. And I think that that was perhaps the right thing in 99, 2000. I, I have come to wonder whether there are a number of these somewhat regulated industries that are, um, that are actually, uh, uh, if you can go through some of the hoops, it may be worth it because uh, so many people are discouraged, uh, both um, on the entrepreneur side and of course also on the investor side here in Silicon Valley. There's a almost allergic reaction to anything that's regulated. And so if you, uh, if you go into one of these uh, partially regulated industries, it can be a slower, but if you get through some of the hoops, this can be a, this can be a fairly, uh, a fairly uh, decisive uh, advantage. Um, and then I think the, uh, the other question that's always an important one is, uh, so the initial monopoly, the initial technology, um, having a view on, on the overall marketplace, and then I think the, over, uh, the other one that's always a very important one is this question of the end game. You know, is it sustainable? How, how, how does this work in the long run? When I was, uh, we went through this exercise at PayPal in early 2001. We'd been in business for only 27 months, and it was sort of a discounted cash flow analysis of the business, which is always a little bit of a fictitious exercise. But, uh, but we looked at, uh, you know, it was a very high growth rate, very high discount rate, and almost all the value was in the terminal value. We concluded that 75, 80% of the value of our business came from cash flows in years 2000, um, 2011 and beyond as of 2001. And I, I submit that something like that is true of every single company represented in this room, is that three quarters or more of the value of your business will come from cash flows um, in, 10 years from now in the future 2026 and beyond. This is, this is, that's just the math. That's just the discounted cash flow math equation. Uh, and this is extremely counterintuitive because everything you think about is, well, how do we grow it over the next few months, the next quarter, the next year? And I, I don't want to minimize or diminish these questions, but, um, but the, the, the real value question is not, are you the first mover are you the next mover? The really valuable companies are the last mover. Um, it's, it's the last companies uh, that end up defining the category. It's Google, the last search engine. Microsoft, the last operating system. The last, uh, you know, hopefully uh, uh, PayPal is the last sort of email payments company that will ever be built. It's the last company um, in, a, in a field um, that, uh, that often ends up defining it. So you want to be first to, to get a jump start. Um, and even more importantly, it's an and, it's not an or. You want to be the first mover and you want to be the last mover. And so thinking about uh, this question of how the advantage builds sustainably over, uh, over the long run is a very important uh, kind of question as well. So these are, these are some of the sort of, uh, some of, the sort of uh, questions that I, I tend, to, tend to like zeroing in on. Uh, you know, it's, it's, they're often, um, the, often, the answers are always somewhat speculative. It's, it often involves a story that you tell about how the future looks, how, how things are going to work out. Um, it's not empirical. We don't have time to, to know whether it's going to work or not. Um, you know, by the time it works or hasn't, um, you know, the business already is, has succeeded or is out of business. And so um, it's, it's sort of a very analytic exercise. And how, how coherent is it? How plausible is it? Do we think, um, do we think the story makes sense and, and, and can work? But uh, if you just push on these kinds of questions, uh, you can get to, to an incredibly, uh, um, um, you can get to, I think, a very good sense of the, of the coherence of a, of a strategy. Um, and, it, and it ends up being very powerfully differentiating uh, between uh, many, uh, many different ones. Um, you know, the title today was Developing the Developed World, which is this, this broader rubric that I always try to put everything under that, uh, you know, we've, that I think that as the um, 21st century progresses, we can have uh, progress through globalization, through copying things that work, and through technology, through doing new things. I often try to 
differentiate these very strongly where I always draw globalization on an x-axis, sort of horizontal, technology on a y-axis, it's vertical. And, um, and I think that, um, I think we should um, always, um, um, we should always uh, keep in mind the sort of vertical, intensive, doing new things as a way to um, open new markets and uh, create new products. Uh, the globalization narrative was very powerful from the 70s to, you know, I think it peaked in 2007. Um, and, um, and I think since the 2008 crisis, we're living in a world where, uh, where uh, uh, I think once again, there's a sense that uh, there needs to be uh, more innovation, doing more things. Things had gotten very unbalanced. People were too focused on globalization, not enough on technology. And it was already embedded in the language we used to describe the world when we divided the world into the developed and developing worlds. That very dichotomy is a dichotomy that's pro-globalization, it's convergence. The developing world is that part of the world that's copying the developed world and converging. But it's also an anti-technological dichotomy because when we say that the US, Western Europe, other countries uh, like that are in the developed world, we're implicitly saying that we're in that part of the world where nothing new is gonna happen, where things are done, finished, um, nothing new will happen. And I think that's a bias that we need to very strongly resist. Um, and um, and you know, the, the banks, the big banks that, uh, that you know, many of us are indirectly uh, competing with, although hopefully not too directly, but indirectly, um, they were geared to globalization like crazy. They forgot about technology. They forgot about doing new things. They have internal politics that preclude them from doing new things. For the same reason, the banks couldn't do something as simple as uh, linking email with money in 1999. Um, they're, they're, um, they're culturally and politically geared against innovation. And that why the, that's why we should never underestimate how big of an opening there really is and, uh, and how we can get back to answering what I think is a very contrarian question of how to go about developing our so-called developed world. Thank you very much.